Hello everyone, my name is Brant Kudrowski and this organic chemistry lab video covers a Wittig reaction experiment. This is part one, the pre-lab. On this slide I'll introduce the Wittig reaction. It was discovered by the German chemist George Wittig, who's shown here in a picture from the Nobel Foundation archive. He was awarded one half of the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1979 for this discovery. In this reaction, a species called a phosphorus illid reacts with an aldehyde or ketone. Here's a picture of a generic phosphorus illid. The features of this molecule include a phosphorus carbon double bond, and this bond is polarized as follows. The phosphorus has a partial positive charge, and the carbon has a partial negative charge. This molecule reacts with an aldehyde or ketone, where the polarization is like this, where the oxygen has a partial minus and the carbon has a partial positive. They line up as such because their partial positives and partial negatives complement each other. In the Wittig reaction, the bonds bisected by the red dotted line here break, and the groups on the upper side of the line get together to form a new species called triphenylphosphine oxide, and the groups below the red dotted line get together to form an alkene. The alkene is the product of interest, and forming this molecule is the reason the Wittig reaction is useful. The Wittig reaction is a good way to make carbon-carbon double bonds. It's a good way to make alkenes. This slide describes some learning objectives for this experiment. After this experiment, you will be able to synthesize an alkene using a Wittig reaction, purify a solid product using recrystallization, determine the purity of your product by melting point analysis, and assess the atom economy of the Wittig reaction. Atom economy is a new concept. It's about keeping track of the atoms that actually get used to form the product versus atoms that are lost in waste, and we'll talk about that towards the end. On this slide, I'll talk about the overall balanced equation for the reaction today. It starts with a species known as a phosphonium salt. This is benzyl triphenyl phosphonium chloride. The carbon next to the phosphorus has two weakly acidic protons. Then the phosphonium salt will get put in with one equivalent of sodium hydroxide, and this base, sodium hydroxide, deprotonates one of these protons to form something called an illid intermediate. We'll go over the mechanism for this and the structure of the illid on a following slide. For right now, though, we're just going to summarize the various reactants. That illid intermediate then will react with an aldehyde in the Wittig reaction, and that will produce an alkene called trans 9 styrol anthracene and a variety of coproducts, including triphenylphosphine oxide, sodium chloride, and water. This slide covers the mechanism of the Wittig reaction in today's experiment. In the first step, the phosphonium salt is deprotonated by the base to give a phosphorus illid, which is a strong nucleophile. The oxygen of the base grabs one of the acidic protons on the phosphonium salt, and those electrons go to form a new carbon-phosphorus double bond, and that gives a species called an illid. The phosphorus illid has a phosphorus-carbon double bond, and it's polarized such that the phosphorus is partially positive and the carbon is partially negative. The other products of this reaction are sodium chloride and water. The illid also has a resonance structure where the Electrons in the phosphorus carbon double bond can be given to carbon, where carbon has a formal minus charge and phosphorus has a formal positive charge. Both of those are valid resonance structures. Oftentimes, though, this is the version of the illid that you'll see with the phosphorus carbon double bond. In the second step, the illid and an aldehyde react to give something called an oxophosphatane intermediate. In our experiment this week, our aldehyde is going to be 9-anthraldehyde, as is shown here. The polarization of aldehydes is that the oxygen has a partial minus charge and the carbon has a partial positive charge due to the electronegativity differences between oxygen and carbon. These molecules then line up such that their partial charges complement each other, and the partially negative carbon of the illid structure attacks the carbonyl carbon of the aldehyde to give a new carbon-carbon bond, and then the electrons in the oxygen-carbon double bond flow to give a new bond between oxygen and phosphorus. The result of those electron movements is a new species called an oxophosphatane intermediate that consists of a four-membered ring and two new bonds, a new bond between phosphorus and oxygen and a new carbon-carbon bond. That oxophosphatane intermediate isn't stable, and in the third step, that oxophosphatane intermediate breaks down to give two new double bonds, a CC double bond, which is weaker, and a phosphorus-oxygen double bond that is stronger. The alkene product in today's reaction is produced as a trans species. However, the Wittig reaction can produce either trans or cis, and sometimes the selectivity can be a little bit complicated. It varies from reaction to reaction, so just be aware of that. Some additional information about this week's experiment that's important is listed here. First of all, phosphorus-oxygen bonds are very strong, and the formation of the phosphorus-oxygen double bond actually drives the Wittig reaction energetically due to a large negative delta H associated with forming this phosphorus-oxygen bond. In today's experiment, we'll purify the crude product by recrystallization to remove the triphenylphosphine oxide co-product that forms in the Wittig reaction. Then, we'll need to dry that product thoroughly before we determine its mass and its melting point. 
This slide talks about the atom economy of the Wittig reaction. Atom economy is an important concept when you're considering the efficiency of a reaction and its ability to generate a product with minimal amounts of waste. Here I have the exact same reaction shown as I've drawn on previous slides, but instead of representing the phenyl groups as just simply pH, I've drawn out all of their structures. When you see them like this, you can really see how big some of the groups really are. We're going to consider the atoms that are incorporated into products versus those that are lost as waste. The atoms in the products are going to be shown in black, while the wasted atoms I'm going to highlight in red. So I'll start with the products. The one product of interest in this reaction is the alkene, and all of the other atoms in all of the other products, triphenylphosphine oxide, sodium chloride, and water, are all going to be discarded. If we look for those atoms in the reactants, I've highlighted those here in red as well. If we add up all the atoms in the products we're keeping, we get 22 carbons and 16 hydrogens. That gives a total mass of 280.36 grams per mole. If we then add up the atoms lost due to products that are going to be thrown out in waste, there are 18 carbons, 17 hydrogens, a sodium atom, two oxygen atoms, a chlorine atom, and a phosphorus atom. Adding those masses together, we get 354.74 grams per mole. Therefore, less than 50% of the mass of the starting materials actually turn up as atoms in the product. This is a little bit of a problem, and it's something to think about when you're doing a Wittig reaction or any reaction that generates a lot of waste. The conclusion here is that the Wittig reaction does have a problem with atom economy. Chemical waste is a problem with this reaction. The particular problem is the triphenylphosphine oxide, which is very large and wastes a lot of atoms. There's been recent work in this area that's helped with this. There was a Nobel Prize in Chemistry awarded in 2005 for olefin metathesis chemistry that generates alkenes, but minimizes the amount of waste and doesn't generate this triphenylphosphine oxide product. So atom economy is an important concept in chemistry and something to think about. On this slide, I'm going to go over calculating moles of hydroxide used in this reaction. This is a calculation that often gives students trouble, so I'm going to give you some details here on how to handle it. We'll be using 50% by mass sodium hydroxide and water as a reagent. The density of 50% aqueous sodium hydroxide is 1.515 grams per milliliter. We'll need this information to answer the question. So here's an example question. Suppose you measured out 5.00 milliliters of 50% NaOH aqueous. How many moles of NaOH do you have? Well, you should start with what you measured out, which is 5 milliliters of 50% aqueous NaOH. I've drawn that quantity out here and divided it by 1. You can divide anything by 1 and it doesn't change the value of that thing. Here the 1 is a placeholder in the denominator. Then I need to think about how to convert milliliters into grams, and this is where density comes in. If I use the density term and set it up like this, I'm saying with this term that there are 1.515 grams of 50% NaOH in every 1 milliliter of 50% NaOH. I have the equation set up like this with milliliters of 50% NaOH in the bottom term so that the units will cancel and I'll be left with units of grams of 50% NaOH. Now I need to go from grams of 50% NaOH to just grams of NaOH. And I know from the definition of percentage that in a 50% solution, there are 50 grams of NaOH in every 100 grams of 50% NaOH solution. This will enable me to cancel the units of grams of 50% NaOH, and now I'm left with grams of pure NaOH. Now I can use the formula weight of sodium hydroxide to calculate moles of sodium hydroxide. The formula weight of sodium hydroxide is 40.0 grams per mole. I'm setting up the equation here with grams of NaOH in the bottom. Now grams of NaOH will cancel and I'll be left with moles of NaOH as my unit. When I do all the multiplication and division, I get that there are 0.095 moles of NaOH. My answer here has two significant digits because of the 50% NaOH term. The line over the zero indicates that that digit is significant. That 50% has two significant digits and that limits my answer to two significant digits. Anytime you're doing multiplication, your answer is limited by the term with the smallest number of significant digits. This slide covers safety in today's experiment. We'll be using 50% sodium hydroxide solution and this is corrosive and it can cause chemical burns. It's very similar to drain cleaner or oven cleaner. You should wear gloves when you're handling this material. We'll also be using the solvent dichloromethane which is toxic and volatile. Wear gloves when you're handling this solvent and also avoid breathing its fumes. The starting aldehyde and the phosphonium salt are both irritants so avoid skin contact with these materials. And the isopropyl alcohol that we'll be using in the recrystallization step is both volatile and flammable, so avoid ignition sources with this material. This concludes the pre-lab video for the Wittig reaction experiment. Stay tuned for the next video in the series that will cover carrying out the reaction. If you found this video useful, check out the next one in the series or watch the prior video. And consider subscribing to my YouTube channel. My name is Brant Kudrowski. Thanks for watching.